baseless claims can do real world damage. And I think even on a personal level, I think we've all experienced this. Even if it was back in high school, somebody saying something about you that wasn't true, how it could impact your, your reputation, your, your friendship. Uh, and then as adults, I think we're all aware of examples of where people have said things that weren't true, uh, hurt the reputation of say a business, uh, damage their ability to do business, uh, hurt them economically. I, I think we understand why saying baseless things about somebody or something else, why that's so dangerous and how much damage it can it can do if left on check. Now, there are laws and there, there are ways to legally hold people accountable for doing that. But if it's being done by someone who's above the law, like say the United States, for example, uh, then the damage can be tremendous and there can be very little that you can do uh, to, to stop this, except maybe speak up against it and, and hope that when people hear these lies these baseless claims they understand that that's what they are and they do not let it affect their perception of who is being lied about and now i'm talking about the united states and these lies about xinjiang first there was genocide then they they downgraded it to cultural genocide and now they can't even get away with saying that so they have shifted the focus onto labor claiming that labor in xinjiang is forced or coerced uh, which which basically means the same thing, especially if you're talking about the International Labor Organization and their definitions. Uh, but they're claiming this about Xinjiang. They've produced absolutely no evidence. And when you hear people talking about coerced or forced labor, you're always going to hear the same, uh, usually two sources. Adrian Zenz, this German supposed academic who works for the uh, US-based or actually Washington DC-based Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, created by the US government, funded by the US government. So Adrian Zenz, that's one source. And then also the US State Department funded, uh, what is it, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. It's the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, but it's funded by the US State Department and, and Western arms manufacturers. These are the two sources we're always going to be hearing these, these stories these baseless claims about forced labor in Xinjiang, uh, Uyghurs being forced to labor in, in cotton fields, on tomato farms and in factories. And of course, there is no evidence of this, uh, but I wanted to dissect. I'm not going to talk about ASP today. I'm going to talk about Adrian Zenz. And I wanted to dissect this report, Course of Labor in Xinjiang. That's the title, Course of Labor in Xinjiang. So labor transfer and the mobilization of ethnic minorities to pick cotton. That's actually what the report is about, labor transfer and the mobilization of ethnic minorities to pick cotton, not Course of Labor in Xinjiang. There is not a single shred of evidence in 20 pages that suggests that there's any sort of coercion taking place. None at all. And there's only one part of a sentence where you could even say that he, he qualifies what he even means by coercion. And it's just some baseless claim that he makes that there are no citations for and there is no evidence to support. He just uh, out of the blue just says these people are not given a choice whether to do these labor transfer programs or not. But then in other parts of the report, he admits that, yes, they do get to choose. Government officials will go into these villages and, and ask them to go work, and they'll say no. And the officials leave the village without their quotas filled. So obviously you can say no, obviously you have a choice. They'll come back, they're very persistent in, in asking them and promoting the idea of these labor transfers, but there there is not a, even an accusation of force being used to make people in China work, to, to go and pick cotton. And uh, 20 pages, I, I've read the whole thing several times now, there is no evidence of coercion at all. It's just Adrian Zenz using the word coercion over and over again and just hoping that you don't notice he never defines it and he never proves it. And the conclusion of the report says everything. Uh, it, it, it admits that there's no evidence. This wasn't a real audit. There's no way of, for him to do a real audit, although others have done a real audit, and I'll show you that. Uh, but let's just kind of let's just kind of go through this report, and uh, because 
it's a long report it's 20 pages and i don't i don't really want to read through this whole report let's just you know let's just kind of uh scan over parts of it we'll read some parts of it we'll scan over other parts of it so let's check it out this is again the title is course of labor in xinjiang but there's no evidence of that at all whatsoever so let's just look at the the executive summary and there's there's three sections and then the fourth section is the conclusion let's read the executive summary let's at least read that much new evidence from chinese government documents and media reports show that hundreds of thousands of ethnic minority laborers in xinjiang are being forced to pick cotton by hand through a coercive state ma mandated labor transfer and poverty alleviation scheme with potentially drastic consequences for global supply chains. This entire first sentence is a complete lie. He, he will show you excerpts from these documents. There's nothing in there about forcing people to pick cotton. There's, there's no mention of that at all whatsoever. That is just Adrian Zenz putting that word in there. Xinjiang produces 85% of China's and 20% of the world's cotton. So right there, that's the actual reason he's writing this report. Because the U.S. wants to hurt China. Cotton is a big business in China. If they can hurt the, the cotton industry in China, they can hurt China. That's what this is all about. It has nothing to do with preventing coerced labor because there is no coerced labor. And his 20-page report almost basically proves that there isn't. Because actually, a lot of the examples that he provides shows you that the, the villagers when they're approached by people promoting these work transfer programs say no to them and that they have to promote it through through like a public relations campaign to get them to say yes they will leave villages without their quotas fulfilled so that that's not coercion if you have the option of saying no then it's not coercive but you'll notice that if you go through this entire this entire document he never defines what he means by coercion. Uh, but there is actually a very definitive uh, meaning for this word when they say, what is forced labor? This is the International Labor Organization. And it's all work or service which is uh, exacted from any person under the threat of a penalty and for which the person has not offered himself or herself voluntarily. So you, you don't get to say no if it's coerced labor. They just force you to do it. They, they threaten to use force or some kind of penalty if you don't do it, uh, or they will use force to make you do it. That's what, that's what that is. So, uh, by the way, that, that link, the link to Adrian Zen's paper here for New Lines Institute uh, and, and everything else that I show you, these, the links will all be in the, the video description below so you can read for it and double check everything I say for yourself. So here, previously evidence for forced labor in Xinjiang pertained only to low-skilled manufacturing, including production of textiles and apparel. This report provides new evidence of coercion specifically related to cotton picking. These findings have much wider implications affecting all supply chains and involve Xinjiang that involve Xinjiang cotton as a raw material. And no, there is no evidence at all. I've read the entire thing. There's no evidence of it at all. Uh, the evidence shows that in 2018, three Uyghur regions alone mobilized at least 570,000 persons into cotton picking operations through the government's coercive labor training and transfer scheme. Do you notice how he just keeps using the word coercive over and over again? He never says why it's coercive. He doesn't even tell you what coercive means, what, what his meaning, his understanding of the word is. He just throws it in there because this is not a, an academic paper. This is an exercise in propaganda. Despite increased mechanization, cotton picking in Xinjiang continues to rely strongly on manual labor. Uh, these targets are mainly achieved through coercive labor transfers because he's talking about how uh, they actually also have Han Chinese coming in and doing cotton picking. It's, a, it's seasonal work. And so people who are looking for seasonal work, they will go to Xinjiang to pick cotton. And what the government's trying to do is encourage people in Xinjiang to, to pick cotton because it'll lower the cost because they're already there. They don't have to move them across the entire country to get there like they've been doing with, say, Han Chinese migrant laborers, which Adrian Zenz mentions in the report right here. And uh, so they're talking about poverty alleviation targets and he's saying these targets are mainly achieved through course of labor transfers but he never he never explains how that's happening or proves that it's happening through evidence 
Cotton picking is grueling and typically poorly paid work. Labor transfers involve course of mobilization through local uh, work teams, transfers of pickers in tightly supervised groups, and intrusive on-site surveillance by government. So he's just, again, he's just putting in nasty sounding adjectives in front of everything. But, but what it is, is there's cotton picking that needs to be done. People need to leave their homes to go do it. And when they leave their homes to go do it, they're in these groups. And uh, there's people, there's staff that go along with them to make sure that everything that they need they can get so if they're upset about something there's an issue with payment they get injured uh, there's somebody there to help them right there they don't have to take a day off and, and go to human resources the human resources are there right next to them that's what he's talking about here and he'll actually admit that further on in the report now again this whole report is going to be in the uh, link to in the video description below so if you think i'm skipping over something that is evidence that there's coercive labor taking place in Xinjiang, feel free to pick a page number uh, and quote it in the comment section uh, below and I'll stand corrected. But believe me, I've read through this whole thing. There is no evidence. A key goal is to keep minorities occupied and surveilled. Factory workers who work and live on secure compounds with dormitories live in environments that are more easily controlled by the state than pastoralists or farmers. Placing minorities into full-time wage labor has become a cornerstone of the state's course of social re-engineering project. And uh, he actually says that in here. But again, that's just him saying that. That's him saying that. There's not There's not even a, a citation or anything. This is just Adrian Zenz making these statements and providing no evidence at all to back it up. Uh, what, what he's actually talking about is poverty alleviation. Now, if you're trying to exploit cheap or coerced labor, you would want these people to remain in poverty. You would not be lifting them out of poverty. You would not be giving them vocational training and empowering them with a way to improve their situation in life, their social standing in society. You would not do that. And he will repeat the word poverty alleviation over and over again and somehow suggest that poverty alleviation and course of labor are somehow linked together when, when they are, they're pretty much mutually exclusive. Uh, they talk about mechanization because uh, if you mechanize all of this, it's the cheapest way of harvesting cotton of all. And so that is a process that's ongoing. And again, he's just talking about them mobilizing all of these workers. And he's just saying just, just the fact that they're mobilizing workers is somehow coercive. And this is the luxury you have when you never define what coercive means. But if you're, if you're asking these people to work and they're saying yes and they're joining this transfer program, that's not coercion. If you're somehow forcing them to join this program, you're not giving them a choice to say no, you have to demonstrate that somewhere with evidence in your report. Adrian Zenz never, never does that. The implications of course of labor in cotton picking. Well, he never actually, I mean, so we're already on page nine. It's only 20 pages long. We're halfway through the report and there, there is nowhere in here. He just keeps using the word coercive, but, but you can see that he never qualifies what actually is coercive about it. And so how can you have the implications of course of labor in cotton picking if you haven't demonstrated how it's coercive in the first place? So again, this is the big this is the big problem with his report here. So they're, then they're then they're conflating the the security apparatus put in place in Xinjiang with these labor transfer programs. There was serious terrorism in Xinjiang. There 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 were uh, people being radicalized by Saudi sponsored Salafism that was overriding indigenous Uyghur culture. Uh, traditions and religion. It was overriding it. It was dividing Muslim communities. These radicals were, were killing other Muslims and also Han Chinese. They were fighting against the government, but they were also just on a campaign to kill people, just ordinary people in society. And they were killing people in Xinjiang, and they were killing people uh, across China, and then they were killing people in the region. They were doing attacks across borders. In Central Asia, there was a bombing here in Bangkok in 2015 by, by Uyghur separatists and extremists. 
and thousands of them joined Al Qaeda and ISIS in Syria. So, so this had nothing to do with Uyghurs being upset with Beijing's policies. These were people who were radicalized by Saudi-sponsored Salafism with America's blessing to turn Xinjiang into a battlefield. That's what they were doing. They were doing the same thing to Xinjiang that the Saudis and the Americans did to Afghanistan in the 80s to expel the Soviets, and what they're doing in Syria right now with these extremists to try and overthrow the Syrian government. And Adrian Zenz never puts any of that context in any of his reports. He just pretends like they, they set up this police state for no reason at all, and somehow it's, it's connected to the labor transfer. All right, now here, finally, we're on page 10. We're halfway through the 20-page report. And, and, and actually, I mean, the cover and the back cover count as pages. So it's actually less than 20 pages. The coercive nature of Xinjiang's transfer of rural surplus laborers. Well, history of labor transfer. Okay. Um, he's just saying, you know, it's a war on poverty. And Adrian Zenz doesn't like the way they, they say they're declaring war and having a battle against poverty. He doesn't, he doesn't like that language. Again, it's a, it's a very superficial thing to point out. And it has no bearing on proving that any of this is coercive. It just, it just sounds kind of like cringeworthy to Westerners who, who might not understand a war on poverty in the West because the West just doesn't care about poor people. Uh, like in the United States, for example, they don't, they don't care about people living in tents on the streets. That's okay for them. Uh, China will wage war against poverty, and, and Adrian Zenz is just hoping that it creates the worst possible picture in your head when you hear it referred to in that way. But of course, it's not a it's not a war with tanks and missiles. So it's a very childish ploy Adrian Zenz is using to kind of uh, to kind of poison the idea of poverty alleviation uh, in the minds of readers. So Xinjiang's labor transfer program started in the early two thousands. Uh, they're talking about the low retention rates and general unwillingness of the predominantly Han Chinese bosses to hire minority laborers because uh, there's some cultural differences and there's a, a reluctance by impoverished people in Xinjiang to, to join these programs. And then even when they join them, they, they don't have you know the sort of work ethic that makes them efficient in hard labor jobs. They, they just have a different background. So in order to be effective, you'd have to go through some sort of training. So th this is what he's describing. And again, he just keeps putting in the word intrusive and coercive, but he never, he still never qualifies it. So precise poverty alleviation. So immediately after she's visit a uh, Xinjiang policy document from July 2014, first employed the term precise poverty alleviation and what he's describing is China making sure that everyone who is in poverty everyone every household uh, is given the opportunity to get out of poverty they want to meet these these uh, goals of eliminating poverty so they need to make sure every single house is pulled out of poverty uh, they have to get these people into jobs where they're making salaries that are above the poverty line that's what this was all about and so to, to to claim that them being enthusiastic about eliminating poverty is somehow coercion is is just ridiculous and that but that's all he does so there's rewards and punishments for not meeting the quotas so he's saying uh, both aspects are important because the course of nature of the labor transfer scheme is strongly linked to course of pressures built into the overarching uh, poverty alleviation framework <laughs> So, so because you'll get in trouble if you don't meet your quotas of eliminating poverty, somehow he's, he's implying that officials will be tempted to coerce people into these jobs, which, which could possibly have happened, but that's not a matter of policy. That would be a matter of a, a individual official taking it upon himself to do that. So that's, that's not systematic coercion and he never proves any even that's happening he doesn't even have an example of that happening so it continues uh intensified battle militarized training and thought transfer information and uh, so he's saying it's becoming even more coercive even though he hasn't explained how it was coercive to begin with training settings for targeted groups of rural surplus laborers uh, became highly militarized increasingly securitized and in several ways not dissimilar to the vocational internment camps uh, in several ways, but not in all ways. 
And uh, again, this is like the whole report is like this. Um, the main purpose of this intensified coercion is to enable the state to guarantee labor transfer outcomes. Uh, again, like just look at everywhere they use the, the, the root word coerce, coercive, coerced, coercion. Uh, he's just throwing it in there. He's not qualifying it. You could read the, the paragraph before and after and there just is no evidence of coercion, but hey, let's let's look at this. So we're already at page 13 in a in a 20 page report. Here, section three. So first of all, the available evidence, let's just read the implications, the end of section two. The available evidence clearly suggests that labor transfers for cotton picking are taking place in an increasingly co coercive environment, especially since the middle of 2016, such transfers occur under high degrees of coercion. This also explains why local minorities have been replacing Han migrants from other parts of China since at least 2017. No, it's because it's cheaper to to get them, people living in the area, to do the work in that area than, than to bring people from across the country. That's, that's the motivation there. And they're trying to encourage Uyghurs to go and do this work and other ethnic minorities in the region. So now, okay, finally, evidence of coercion in the recruitment, transfer, and management of transferred laborers in Xinjiang's cotton picking sector. So maybe the reason we didn't see any evidence uh, up until this point is because he saved it all for section three. So overcoming laziness, how the state mobilizes minority cotton pickers. So of course, they're gonna overcoming it they're going to overcome it by coercion, right? Since cotton picking is hard work, state propaganda accounts of mobilizing pickers have the overarching theme of overcoming workers' uh, resentments uh, to participate in the scheme. This is unilaterally ascribed to two main factors. their outdated and backwards employment views which are said to cause minorities to be stuck in their traditional ways of making a living and an ingrained laziness and lack of work discipline, even a lack of valuing work. And then they talk about how they glorify hard work and discipline and uh, tr you know, transforming these people from needing a blood transfusion or support from the state to making their own blood. And I mean, this is a key component to poverty alleviation. There's some people who are impoverished that if you give them an opportunity, they will jump at it. And there's other people who will not. And there's all kinds of reasons why they might not. They, they might have an ingrained way of looking at the world and they're reluctant to go out of their comfort zone. And so what he's going to describe all throughout section three is the government coming in, promoting the work transfer programs and providing them incentives because they have to have incentives because they're, they'll say no and they won't make their quotas. So they have all of these incentives to get them to say yes. And that's what he's going to describe. And so section three of Adrian Zen's report on course of labor in Xinjiang actually proves that there is no coercion taking place. That is a system of incentives that the government goes into these villages with to entice them to go and do these jobs. It's not coercive, not by any definition, not, not by the definition of the uh, international labor organization and he doesn't define it himself so we really we don't know other than the fact that he just keeps throwing the word coercion in there since recruitment is the most crucial aspect of labor transfer the state combines its sophisticated and fine-grained security apparatus with a set of intrusive social control mechanisms in order to maximize the labor transfer mobilization not only of Uyghurs and Kazakhs in Xinjiang but also of Tibetans in the Tibet autonomous region these mechanisms are key are a key reason why labor transfer employment constitutes course of labor so what what are they let's let's see what they are so there's these cadres that go into these villages to to get people to go to work where is the where is the coercion um again and now here he is he's conflating the security apparatus and the detainment of extremists in xinjiang with the work program and he will admit that there is he, he suspects that there's some kind of connection, but he's not able to prove it. He says that uh, somewhere in this document, uh, we, we might pass it. Since the work of these teams takes place in a system where the transition between 
Securitization, surveillance, social control, and poverty alleviation is seamless. There's no telling where coercion stops and where locals may exhibit a degree of consent. There's no way to tell. There's no way to tell, so then there's no way you could write a report with the title uh, Coercive Labor in Xinjiang. You, you cannot prove that that's happening if you cannot tell where one begins and the other ends, where coercion and consent exist. If you don't know where, where they exist, then you don't know that there's coercion taking place. He says it in his own re report. Numerous government and related media accounts document that village-based work teams who enter every single local home play a key role in mobilizing rural, low-income Uyghurs and other minorities into picking cotton. Uh, okay, okay, so they're going in and they're trying to mobilize them. Uh, let's see what happens. Uh, so here's one account from December 2017 from Aymak Village in Aksu Pre Prefecture notes that the village-based work team was commending outstanding cotton pickers among 77 villagers who had been organized to pick cotton. The account states that through long-term preaching, the state is creating an atmosphere that labor is glorious and laziness is shameful. And, and so what, what's he talking about? He's talking about a public relations campaign to change the mindsets of people. It's like in the West, when you have these public service announcements uh, about racism or homophobia or, or not, not being an alcoholic or a drug addict or, or a gambler. There's a problem in society, something that people seem to generally agree is, is a negative behavior. And so that there's these public campaigns to deal with this behavior. And this is what they're describing here. This isn't coercion. This is a public campaign. A 2019 report from Wensu County in Aksu Prefecture notes that after getting rid of old fashioned blocked and lazy thoughts of the peasants and herders, the town has used employment as the golden key to unlock the poverty solving problem. People's thoughts were liberated through education and 9,669 were put through the labor transfer scheme. In the autumn, locals were mobilized to strive for work and to pick cotton. Finally, a September 2018 account from uh, Baicheng County in Aksu Prefecture describes how the village-based work teams patiently liberated Uyghur villager Er Ali Hakim uh, from his serious thought problems, thanks to thought transformation work, he followed the call to go and pick cotton once he received the work team's notification. At the end of the account, he is cited as saying, and then he talks about how he was lazy and now how he's happy, he's working, and he's able to make his family's life better. Village-based work teams and other government workers spare no effort in, mobile, in the mobilization process, uh, so they enter every home for a second time. Why did they enter the home for a second time? Okay, they're, they're talking about this prefecture where locals were discovered to be unwilling to go out and work. Okay, unwilling to go out and work. Officials entered every home for a second time and undertook thought education work until 60 persons had been mobilized into picking cotton. Many of those shown, okay, and then, <laughs> and then he constantly sprinkles in all of these other things, like everyone else was in detention camps and he, there's no footnote or anything proving any of it. It's just things Adrian Zenz throws in there to make it sound more sinister. So how could it be coercive work if they went into the homes and people were able to say no and they had to leave? And then they, they would come back again to try again. It's like a company going to a job fair at a high school and they don't get their quotas this year. So they come back next year. Is that coercion or is that just a, a persistent attempt to recruit uh, work workers? Uh, very, very clearly, it's the latter. It's not coercion. The mobilization of minority cotton pickers can involve other measures designed to free them to leave their homes for two months. This includes centralized child care and elderly care, as well as organizing the remaining villagers into small teams to look after the animals of those who pick cotton based on previous research. And then he's going to say all of these horrible things ha happen at these, you know, the children are forced to speak Mandarin at the boarding schools. Uh, but if it's coerced labor, I mean, why why bother with these incentives? 
the incentives are there to get them to say yes because they can also say no if it was coerced labor they would just go in there force you to do the work and why would they care what happened to your livestock or your kids or your parents they why would they care and yet he's describing all of these incentives that they have to show the villagers in order to get them to say yes so again this is, actually, this is actually all evidence that it's not coercive. As a result of labor transfer mobilization, propaganda accounts proudly proclaim that cotton growers no longer have to search for workers. So before they used to have to look high and low to find these workers, and they would eventually find them, uh, but now they don't have to because they're, they're, the government has stepped in and they, they know who needs the workers and they know who needs jobs. They know who all these poor people are that need better income. And so they, they match supply and demand. Uh, again, how is this coercive? Uh, just because Adrian Zenz throws the word coercion in, uh, in every sentence, almost every sentence here. Uh, so these are numerous, these and numerous similar accounts raise grave concerns about systemic state-sponsored coercion in the annual process of mobilizing hundreds of thousands of local so again please if i if i'm missing anything point out where he actually shows coercion is taking place he admits that they they had to go into the home twice because the first time they said no if you're able to say no without consequence then there's no coercion it's it's very simple uh, according to the International Labor Organization, that's not coercive labor. Uh, if they were being forced to, if they weren't given the choice, yes or no, then it's coercive. So Adrian Zenz obviously has uh, an un, an unwritten definition of what coercion means that he's not letting us uh, into. And I have, a f I have a funny feeling that it has more to do with him just smearing China and hoping no one p uh, picks up on what he's doing here in this report. So that was the section about evidence. That that was the section on evidence. Okay, and o over overcoming the the laziness of uh, and this was supposed to be the evidence of coercion, and I just don't see it. Streamlined process, efficient large scale operations with guaranteed outcomes. Uh, and again, there's there's nothing. Here. They're not talking about anything here. They're just talking about they they mobilize workers, which is true, and they don't deny that. Uh, then they're talking about how the how the work details actually how they go. So uh, you have these people from these villages. They're, they're reluctant to do it in the first place because they haven't done it before. They, they have to travel away from home. The government is assuring them that their homes, their 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 parents, their children will all be taken care of. Go make this money and then come back. Come back to your parents, your kids, your your livestock, your your small farms. There's another incentive. When you go on these work details, they are going to have support staff living side by side with you the entire time. So anytime you have a problem, you can ask them for help. But watch how uh, Adrian Zenz spins this. So the transfer of cotton pickers likewise typically follows a centralized and supervised process that involves accompanying government minders. Okay, not, he's not gonna say support staff. He's gonna say government minders. Uh, and so they're going to talk about a 2015 account speaks of the labor transfer of 2,293 workers, mostly couples, for cotton picking and other agricultural work. In one village, 200 laborers were accompanied by a team of seven cadres, a ratio of about 29 workers per cadre. An account from 2019 makes the expectations that come with the, that arrangement very clear. Faced with the strong-willed and simple-minded villagers, the work team gathered everyone together to state the demands. The first thing is to keep in mind that all migrant workers are a collective. Travel and work must be done in an organized and disciplined manner and by obeying the arrangements of the accompanying village cadres. And like, like if you've ever done a hard job, any kind of menial labor, that is how it is everywhere you go. You have to be disciplined. You have to be organized. You have to listen to what your boss says. Are you going to get fired? You're not going to get paid. Uh, you might get paid, but you might get pay your, your payment cut or something. 
you have to do what they tell you or like why are they paying you it's just common sense like adrian zen's never worked a real job in his life i'm not saying that he hasn't but he's writing this as if he has never worked a real job in his life because if you have worked a real job in your life a hard job hard labor uh there's nothing out of the ordinary about any of this whether you worked in the west or if you worked in china an account from 2017 from Kashgar Prefecture notes that 129 cotton pickers from two villages uh, were accompanied by more than cadres. Local work team cadres and police station guards regularly visit them often and provide them with security services. What does that mean? He never tells you. He never tells you what those security services were. Uh, did someone have a disagreement or a fight and they bring in the police? To resolve it is that a security service i don't know because adrian zenz never tells us and I, I suspect that if it was malign some some kind of service that had a malign intention he'd be more than happy to describe it and i i suspect that it was benign and that's why he is leaving it up to your imagination now uh here similarly a report from Aksu from 2020 states that cotton pickers are transferred to their work destination in a point-to-point -point transfer fashion, which the article also refers to as nanny-style service. Cadres have different roles, with some acting as security staff. But but hold on, I just want to point out that this is like an this is kind of like a travel agency where they take care of everything for you, and you just go along with them, and you have a, a tour guide who brings you to everywhere you need to go. And if you have any problems, you talk to them. They, they sort it out for you. And this, that's part of the package. And that's exactly what this sounds like. They, these working schemes sound like, it's obviously not a, you're not going on a tour. You're going to go do hard work, but it's the same process. And if you've ever seen Chinese tourists out on the streets, sometimes they're all wearing a uniform or so like Adrian Zenz makes it like it's, it's so sinister that they're wearing uniforms and they're regimented and they're, they're you know, everything is so orderly. Like this is a, this is an element of coercion. I have seen tour, tours here in Thailand of Chinese tourists doing this sort of stuff. There's nothing sinister about it. It's just a difference in culture. And Adrian Zenz, a supposed academic, instead of sh uh, helping people shed their ignorance, he's preying on it by by depicting it like this. Now, anyway, let's let's read what the what they were doing. These cadres give full play to the frontline cadres acting as instructors, security staff, and service staff. Except under special circumstances, these must eat, live, study, and work together with the cotton pickers, actively carry out ideological education during cotton picking, carry out epidemic prevention and control work, and assist in solving issues related to wage payments or accidental injuries so so again support staff they're there to support the cotton pickers and they're side by side with them the entire time so that a cotton picker doesn't have to take a day off and go to wherever human resources are they have these people working and living side by side with them to make sure they have everything they need throughout the duration of the work assignment like kind of like a tour guide only for working and you get paid instead of paying a tour guide so uh, the account sternly warns cadres that they cannot sleep in but uh, must be with the workers at all times. They are to operate like overseers. <laughs> that, so I, I'm pretty sure Adrian Zenz threw that in to make it sound like they're on horseback with whips and nets and they're, they're lashing them for not working hard enough and throwing nets over the heads of people trying to escape. But of course, you, you, you read the actual excerpt that he was quoting and it's support staff. They're there to make everybody's life easier. So another report, they're, they're talking about how they had a competition to get people to pick as much as possible. And he's saying that is problematic. But then he's going to talk about the average income. And he's going to say that you can earn up to 10,000 RMB. So when you hear up to 10,000 RMB, it usually implies that there's a certain amount of work. And if you do the full amount of work, you will get 10,000 RMB. And if you do less than that, you're going to get less than 10,000 RMB, just like pretty much any other job in the world. If, if you were to work full time, you would get this salary. But if you work half of that time, you're not going to get that. It's not going to get that full salary. And that difference in wages is not indicative of course of labor. It's indicative of you not wanting to make your full wage because you didn't want to work full hours. 
And so that's exactly what he's describing here. So he's, he's talking about how um, uh, you'd have to, he's, he's giving you what the, the baseline is for poverty in the minimum wage in Xinjiang. And he's saying that some people reportedly got more than, than minimum wage and others were like under it or just barely around the, the minimum wage or the average wages. And then he admits that he doesn't have enough information to even uh, say that this means anything. But again, he just described to you that you can earn up to that amount, but it uh, here, these averages also are skewed by the fact that especially skilled or able body pickers can earn high amounts while the majority of workers are left with comparatively mediocre remuneration. So uh, people who can pick a lot will make a lot. And if you pick a little, you make a little. Uh, uh, how is this coercive? What what he's trying to do is because there, there is a way that it could be coercive. If they promised you 10,000 RMB over the course of the entire work detail, and then they didn't pay you that, you did everything they asked you, but they didn't pay you that that's 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 abusive that's coercive but that's not what he's describing he's saying uh, they did less work so they got paid less that's there's nothing coercive about that especially if they made that clear during the recruiting process and he says state propaganda accounts often claim that cotton pickers can earn up to 10,000 RMB they're not guaranteeing you 10,000 they're saying you can make up to that so it's very obvious what Adrian Zenz is doing throughout this entire report. This is what he's doing throughout the entire report. He's taking an ordinary working arrangement, uh, people going out and looking for workers, promoting these work details, providing incentives to say yes because they can say no. And then different aspects like payment where you can make a certain amount, but you won't if you don't apply yourself. He's trying to take all of these normal things that are associated with any job anywhere in the world, and he's trying to spin it as if it's coercive by, by basically just putting the word coercive in there over and over again. And so here's the implications, and we're already at conclusions, and as I told you, it's 20 pages, but it's like the last page is a back cover, so not even really 20 pages. So we're at the end here. Implications. The evidence presented in section two show that the recruitment and deployment of cotton pickers takes place within the general context of a course of labor transfer scheme. No, it does not. He never proved that and he doesn't even bother defining what coercion even means. This by itself would constitute sufficient evidence to raise serious concerns over forced labor in cotton picking. So uh raising serious concerns over forced labor not proving that it's actually taking place the abundance of cases presented in this section strengthens this evidence considerably given that these cases clearly demonstrate coercion in labor transfer processes uh, specific to cotton picking and uh, no none of these uh, these examples prove the exact opposite that people were going into these villages and were being told no and they would have to come back uh, that people are making above minimum wage uh, salary doing this, but some aren't because they're not applying themselves. It's, it's, it's common sense. It's very reasonable, but he's just going to put the word coercion in there to just claim that it's coercion anyway. Overall, it is clear that labor transfers for cotton picking involve a very high risk of forced labor. A very high risk of forced labor is different than actual forced labor. Like getting into the car and driving around a city involves the risk of getting into an accident, but that doesn't mean that every time you get into a car, uh, you get into an accident. And so, so again, Adrian Zenz has literally nothing in this report. There is no coercion uh, proven or, or demonstrated or even really suggested because the things he's claiming are coercive when you, when you think about it, aren't even coercive. And then here, this is the best part. However, in a system where the transition between securitization and poverty alleviation is seamless and where the threat of extra legal internment looms large, it is impossible to define where coercion ends and where local consent may begin, which is a very odd way of wording that. Actually, the way it should be worded is, I don't know where consent ends and coercion begins. That's the way he should have worded it. But he's being dishonest, so why not? Do it backwards and put the word coercion first so that's what sticks foremost in your mind and then here's the conclusion so 
Two of his three key findings have nothing to do with coercion at all. The production of Xinjiang cotton continues to rely heavily on manual labor, primar primarily in cotton picking. This applies even more to the production of high, higher quality cotton. So number one mentions absolutely nothing at all whatsoever about uh, coercion. Number two, the state's labor transfer scheme mobilizes hundreds of thousands in 2018, upward to half a million cotton pickers from ethnic minority regions. Again, the, the government being able to mobilize large numbers of seasonal workers does not in and of itself indicate coercion at all. It just means they're really good at mobilizing workers. So what? And number three, so two out of three already have nothing to do with course of labor even though the, the title of this paper is Course of Labor in Xinjiang, uh, there are strong indicators. There are strong indicators, uh, which is different than uh, actual evidence of, that labor transfer scheme, the labor transfer scheme is coercive in key aspects, recruitment, transfer, on-site management. Evidence for this exists both for the broader scheme in general and specifically for labor transfer into cotton picking. Zero evidence was, was pr provided for any of this. And I went over the examples that he, he himself presented, and you could see that it's not coercive. They have support staff there to help these people because they're already apprehensive about going on in the first place. Having these people by their side, he's trying to make it as if they're their minders or overseers or slave masters. When the, the, the quote, the excerpt that he put in his own report makes it very clear that they're living and working side by side with them to help them to address all of the things that they would, they would be faced during the work detail before going back home. Uh, so you see how he's spinning absolutely everything. And then down here, therefore, it is very likely that a major share of cotton production in Xinjiang is tainted with forced labor. Very likely is different than actually is. And so this is, look, this is number four conclusions. This is his conclusion. Okay. His conclusion is that it's very likely. It's, his conclusion is not it's happening. There is coerced labor in Xinjiang. He's saying it's very likely that it's happening, and he never explains what very likely even means. Again, this, is, this has nothing to do with academia or, or academic study or evidence-based research. This is just a propagandist throwing a bunch of words together and sprinkling it with the word coercion. Uh, and then he's saying it must be assumed that any cotton from Xinjiang may involve course of labor. And, and he's saying that because there's a risk of it even though he, he, he doesn't prove that and he doesn't even qualify or quantify that risk at all. And then he's saying, let's put san let's the government put sanctions on, on China. Let's put more sanctions. Let's put them all out of business. And there he is. There's the man, Dr. Adrian Zenz, uh, victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, Washington, D.C., uh, created and funded by the U.S. government. Uh, this is the guy telling us that there's course, uh, let's see, what is the title of the paper? Let's get it right. Um, course of labor in Xinjiang. And he, he, out of 20 pages, if you're counting the covers, uh, he doesn't prove that there's any coercion at all whatsoever. As a matter of fact, he's giving you accounts as part of his report, proving that government officials go into these villages, ask them to work and they say no, and they have to leave. And I have to come back later and try again. That that is the exact opposite. That is literally the exact opposite of coercion, of coerced labor. And so uh, I'm smiling and laughing because it's so ridiculous. But at the same time, the whole reason I made this video is because uh, people are losing work because of this. There are companies in China being damaged because of this. There are companies doing business with companies in China that are being damaged because of these lies, uh, lies put out there by Adrian Zenz, buttressed by state media like uh, CBC Canada. Uh, Daniel Dumbrell and I just did a video about a CBC piece about tomato production in Xinjiang. It's the exact same thing. And they literally brought Adrian Zenzin to say the exact same thing, that there is a high risk of 
coerced labor and no evidence at all was produced that actual coerced labor was taking place uh, the companies that they contacted all said there is none there was a del monte said we know that the tomatoes are coming from xinjiang we know that there's uyghur workers there but we also know that there's no coercion taking place and um one one last thing i want to point out here about uh adrian zen's uh report here it says in the absence of the ability to conduct meaningful and independent audits of actual working conditions, it must be assumed that any cotton from Xinjiang may involve course of labor with the likelihood of coercion being very high. And again, like I said, he doesn't qualify or quantify that, but uh, as a matter of fact, you can do audits because this is from Skechers and these, this is one of the companies that has been implicated in, in somehow benefiting from coerced labor. And Skechers put out a statement that they said, we heard this, uh, this was from Aspie, uh, which is, you know, Aspie and Adrian Zenz, they, they reference each other. And, and it's the same lie, it's just two different people saying it. Because the more people you have repeating the lie, the better. And Skechers put out this statement and they said they, they contacted the company immediately. They themselves conduct audits. And there was no, there, there are Uyghurs working there, but they could leave if they wanted to. There was no indication that it was coerced labor. And you, you kind of have to say uh, how credible this sketcher statement is because Adrian Zenz just did a 20 page report and he couldn't find any evidence at all of coercion. And his conclusion literally said there's, there's a risk of it. And he, he can't do an audit, but Skechers did do an audit and they said no. And even Adrian Zenz, the, the examples he provides in his report suggest that people aren't being coerced. Uh, the government's promoting work to these groups, you know, asking them to come and work and giving them incentives, but no one's forcing them to say yes. And if they say no, the government has to come back on another day and try again. And this is the nature of recruitment. Every company in the world has to go out and recruit workers you know they have to attract people to come and they have to to do it repeatedly if, if they cannot get uh, people to fill certain positions in a certain time frame so uh, this is adrian zenz and the u.s government and the western media as a whole telling baseless lies that are doing real damage they're doing damage to not just china and its image on the global stage but china's economy uh, specific companies in China are being hurt. Companies doing business with companies in China are being hurt. And these Uyghur workers that everyone in the Western media, people like Adrian Zenz and the US government pretend to care about, they're actually creating the conditions to put them out of work and plunge them back into poverty. And the reason they want to do that is so that they could uh, open the door to extremism and violence again. Because uh, you tell lies like this about a country you don't like because you want to hurt the country. And that's, they, that's what the U.S. wants to do. It's no secret. They want to hurt China. And the U.S. has a history. Just 21st century alone, the U.S. and its allies are guilty of the worst crimes against humanity. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen. Uh, and then, you know, the regime change in Ukraine, uh, the, the sanctions against Venezuela and Iran and North Korea, the riots in Hong Kong, and now the U.S. backed violence in Myanmar. And now they're doing it to China and they're using the same method of just telling ridiculous lies. And, uh, you know, Adrian Zenz, his trick is just uh, overwhelming you with pages and pages of, of words and the, using the word coercion, even though he never qualifies it, and pictures and maps and graphs, just hoping that you go through it and you just assume that somewhere in there he's got the evidence. But I assure you, he does not. So if you thought this video was useful, please like and share it. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Um, all of the references are in the video description below. Check it out. Uh, I'm not going to dissect every paper Adrian Zenz puts out, but I thought I would dissect this one to a certain extent. We didn't go through it line to line, uh, line for line, but uh, I think I went over it enough to show what his methodology is. And so the next time you see him rolled out as some sort of expert, just listen to him more critically and look through his papers more critically. And I, you'll see him using these same tricks uh, in everything that he does. And you'll see Aspie does the exact same thing.
Also in the video description are ways you can help support my work. To everyone who has been supporting my work, thank you so much. Uh, whether it's through Patreon month to month, one-time donations, or even if you're helping share this work, I could not do this work without that support. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.